Welcome to Antitrust Matters, a Constantine Cannon podcast where we have engaging and timely conversations about competition policy in the digital age. My name is Jeff Schindler, and I'll be your host. Antitrust has always mattered to consumers and businesses, but today it is also in the public discourse more than ever. From how we get our food on our plates, to how we travel, to the way we interact daily using digital apps and platforms, antitrust touches each and every one of us in ways we may not even realize. In Antitrust Matters, we bring you perspectives of experts and visionaries in the field who discuss where antitrust law has been, where it is going, and why it matters today more than ever before. Welcome to Antitrust Matters, Constantine Cannon podcast, where we have discussions about antitrust policy and its impact on various markets. My name is Jimmy Kovacs, and I'll be hosting today's podcast along with my colleague, Gene Kim. As background, Constantine Cannon is doing a number of these podcasts concerning the new draft merger guidelines, and I would highly recommend our listeners listen to the October 3rd, 2023 podcast with Michael Cadis, Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division at the United States Department of Justice, where he discusses in greater detail the draft merger guidelines, along with Jeff Schinder and Wyatt Ford. Today's focus is going to be on the intersection of these new draft guidelines with issues in healthcare antitrust. Gene and I are joined today by Professor Tim Greeny, who I'll introduce in a moment. But as a refresher, I'd like to turn it over to Gene to provide some background information on the new draft merger guidelines. Gene? Well, first, hello. I'm Gene Kim. And as Jimmy just noted, I'm a partner at Constantine Cannon. Very excited for today's podcast. There's been a lot of lively debate amongst the antitrust bar, amongst enforcers about the new draft guidelines. And I've been happily taking in some of the debate on the sidelines, the various presumptions that are attendant to the draft guidelines and how they will break on proposed mergers going forward has been the source of a lot of conjecture, complaints even. There's been a lot of debate about whether or not the draft guidelines, as the agencies have represented, uh, really hew to old precedent or whether they are, in fact, tipping the scales and making it easier for enforcers to succeed in challenging mergers. So I hope we can focus on a couple of those presumptions today, especially those that we think will particularly impact the healthcare market. Thanks, Gene. So our guest today is Professor Tim Greeny. He currently serves as a research professor at the University of California Law in San Francisco. And full disclosure for our listeners, I previously was a faculty fellow for Professor Greeny when he was a Chester A. Myers Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Health Law Studies at St. Louis University School of Law. Professor Greeny, it's fair to say he knows antitrust law. He served as Assistant Chief in the Department of Justice in the Antitrust Division. He has written numerous articles and has a great deal of professional experience concerning antitrust and healthcare. And so thank you very much, Tim, for joining us today. A pleasure. So let's do some table setting for everyone. Under the existing merger guidelines, uh, it's fair to say that the Federal Trade Commission has been highly successful in blocking numerous hospital mergers. And those include recent victories in merger matters in New Jersey and also those involving the HCA's attempted acquisition of Stewart Healthcare Hospitals in, in Utah. And so, Professor Greeny, given the recent victories by the federal government, and then these victories, just so our audience are aware, they come off of the back of the FTC losing a bunch of cases, doing retrospectives, and, and sort of changing their approach. But under the existing merger guidelines, the FTC has been very successful. So, do you still believe, even though that these cases have gone forward, the FTC has been successful, that there are still competitions in the healthcare space that need to be addressed? Yeah, I do. And um, along with the uh, colleagues at UC Law SF and at uh, the Petrus Center at Berkeley, we filed comments supporting the changes in the merger guidelines. And one of the reasons is that uh, to some extent, uh, antitrust law has not kept up with modern economic thinking. And economics has moved beyond sort of the simplistic Chicago school 
rules that govern some of the old precedent. So I think it's a much needed update. And the other reason it's particularly needed is in the healthcare sector, where concentration has really grown significantly. So despite the victories in litigation that uh, you just mentioned, there is nevertheless rampant concentration. The hospital sector, hospital markets, at least the MSAs, 94% are highly concentrated. Specialty physician markets are also highly concentrated. 78% have highly concentrated markets in specialty physicians. And of course, the insurance market is highly concentrated. So you have a sector that is not only highly concentrated, but the overwhelming economic evidence is that concentration results in higher prices. Prices are higher across the board in all those sectors I just mentioned. And also, there's growing evidence, and there's an excellent article in the Bill Bank Quarterly that sort of dissects what the new learning is about quality and efficiency. And it really spells out, it's Mark Pauley and Lawton Birds, two of the most respected economists around, it really spells out that bigness does not improve quality and that uh, beyond a certain minimal level of scale, quality doesn't increase significantly. And in fact, there's some evidence that it deteriorates. So all that adds up to a problem. And the question is, what can be done? And we'll, I think we'll talk a little about the potential efficacy of merger guideline revisions, but um, it certainly is, a, I think, an important step forward and much needed. Professor, you mentioned the concentration that is occurring in the various healthcare sectors. One area of concern appears to be powerful healthcare systems. Can you explain that concept and why enforcers should be concerned? Yeah, we put together a long, mind-numbing uh, law review article in the U Hastings Law Journal about cross-market mergers specifically. And I coined the phrase system power. And the idea is that healthcare systems are potentially a good thing. They may spur some innovation. But one problem is that that system power sometimes translates into market power, monopolistic or oligopolistic power. And we can talk in a few minutes about where that's been manifest. But clearly, the problem is that large systems have the incentive and the ability to extend their market power beyond just the hospital markets in which the FTC has successfully litigated mergers into other areas and specifically across regions so that they can exercise market power that extends across an entire region. And that's sort of uh, new evidence has come out on that in economics. And uh, the question is, how long will it take for the law to catch up with it? So one point of clarification, Professor, that'd be useful for our listeners is you use the term cross-market mergers. Can you provide a, a definition for our listeners on that point? Sure. What that really means is sometimes a hospital system will acquire another hospital that's not in its geographic market. And there's an old saying that all healthcare competition is local, or at least most of it is, because patients can only travel so far and insurance coverage reaches only a certain limit. So the notion is that uh, in some cases, though, the merger goes outside of the geographic market that's been commonly recognized, the local market. And those mergers have been essentially immune from antitrust scrutiny. And until recently, the assumption was that there can't be any harm from those kind of mergers because they're in a different market. And indeed, the, the system's entering a new market. So maybe that's a good thing. Well, it turns out that the mounting economic evidence suggests that the ability to raise price is increased by that cross-market uh, situation. And that indeed, because there are common customers in the adjacent markets or the nearby markets that there are common insurers, that the system can exercise its market power in various ways. And the most common one and the most talked about one is so-called all or nothing contracting, in which the system says, look, if you want our system, you have to pay the piper for all our hospitals, not only the must-have hospitals, the hospitals you need to compete, but you're going to have to pay the piper to the insurance company. You're going to have to pay the piper for all our hospitals, including the ones in which are in competitive markets, which you may not want so much. We're going to get a premium on them too. And uh, the poster boy for this effect is the case recently brought by the California Attorney General and the plaintiffs in this Sidibe case, which was very skillfully argued by the Constantine law firm, 
in which the, the claim was this all or nothing contracting. And you guys can speak more knowledgeably about it than I can, since you, you devoted blood, sweat and tears to that case. The all or nothing contracting really was a device by which market power could be extended into adjacent or markets across a region. And what spurred a lot of this was some evidence coming out of the Petrus Center at Berkeley that showed Northern California prices were way higher than Southern California prices. And the notion was that that ability to raise price through market power, through this cross-market leverage, all or nothing contracting, et cetera, and other devices was critical. So, you know, the problem in antitrust has been keeping up the law with the economic evidence. And new cases bring new law, but it takes a while to turn that big uh, tanker boat in the ocean to get precedent moving. So that's why the merger guidelines have caught a lot of attention. The idea that they can change judicial preferences or judicial views the way evidence is looked at. So one of the things that you were just mentioning was sort of the Petrus Center's work, which has been instrumental in looking at, at cross-market mergers. When you talk about all or nothing contracting, I believe are there other there go research that has been done in this space, including Lemore Daphne. Can you speak to that? Yeah. The important economic studies that, that have come out point to higher prices resulting from these cross market mergers. So you have Lemore Daphne, a very well known economist at Harvard, found twelve percent price increases across markets. And these were price increases in the acquiring system. So when you think about it, when the acquiring system can raise prices, you say, well, wait, that's not because the hospital that was acquired lacked skill or negotiating sophistication. It really suggests that market power was created. And other studies by Flum and others showed similarly high price increases as well. And there's additional research that's going to be forthcoming that hasn't been published yet. So the idea is that this area, which was effectively a, a grant of immunity, if you want to call it that, cross market mergers, should be looked at a little more carefully and that theories need to be developed and law these to move forward to stop mergers in these cases. And uh, we could go into this in a minute, but the new merger guidelines have addressed it quite specifically. Okay. You've touched upon this, Professor, but it may not be immediately apparent given the complexities of healthcare markets. Shall these merged entities across markets are able to effectively raise prices. Can you kind of get into the mechanisms by which they're able to raise prices through these types of mergers? Yes. I mean, the critical notion is that there's additional leverage created by this. And one economist called it creating holes in the markets that are served by insurance companies. And insurance companies, the economic evidence seems to suggest that when there's a hole in the market that they serve, the broader market, that additional leverage in the hands of the health system enables them to raise price because they know they have customers, they have employees in some cases of the employer who live across in the adjacent market, or they have an insurer who really wants that blanket coverage across the entire region. And when that hole is created, that creates a problem. Now, in the Sutter case, we saw other mechanisms too, by simply making the price so high, if you don't take all of them, that's another effective way. And we can talk about potential tying as a mechanism for that. So there are different mechanisms that can be used. And of course, the so-called gag orders, the fact that the insurer and the employer really aren't allowed to speak about the differential in prices, all those things add up to mechanisms that enable the exercise of market power. So it's a, uh, recurring problem. And the question is, when and how can the law develop mechanisms and precedents to address it? So let's talk about some of those mechanisms and let's get into the draft merger guidelines. As we were discussing in the beginning, the hospital merger space where hospitals or providers are operating within the same geographic market is well-trotted ground in terms of the analysis and case law that's out there. In what way do you view the draft merger guidelines impacting both cross-market mergers that we're discussing right now and also vertical acquisitions? And for our audience, we think about vertical acquisitions in the provider space as being hospitals acquiring downstream primary care doctors or physicians in general. You could also have acquisitions involving 
health insurance plans with providers as well. And so it's a vertical transaction and usually it involves the source of referrals, which are the doctors. And so, Professor, maybe you can speak about how these draft merger guidelines may impact those types of transactions, which have not been readily reviewed as of recently. Right. And as I said at the beginning, there are gaps in enforcement and the gaps are now becoming more and more apparent. And uh, the two you mentioned, cross-market and vertical, are things that the guidelines specifically address. And they address some other things that are very important that have also been neglected, so-called potential competition mergers, which have just sort of fallen by the wayside. I litigated one 100 years ago, but uh, those mergers are important too. But the idea is that uh, these gaps now are, uh, we are now seeing the results of the under-enforcement in that area. So to start with the vertical, which you just mentioned, there's been a gold rush, a feeding frenzy in which hospitals have acquired physician practices such that um, enormous sectors of uh, physician practice are now controlled by hospitals owning those practices. And by the way, as a sidelight, I'll mention there's another important development in the case that was just recently filed by the FTC involving private equity, in which private equity firms buy these physician practices or affiliate in some very close way with these physician practices. And they do what's called roll-ups. In other words, they take a few at a time or one at a time, and they usually fly under the radar screen. They're not even noticed to the FTC and DOJ. And um, they acquire one after another in a piecemeal fashion. And once they have that many, they have then the ability to raise price. The case filed in Texas shows that in three major markets, Dallas, Houston, and Austin, the price increases were enormous compared to peer markets. Uh, they, the complaint speaks of higher prices in the dozens of millions of dollars over time in anesthesia practices that were rolled up by private equity. So that's just one example. In the hospital vertical acquisition area, what the merger guidelines do that's very important is they propose some guidelines, some thresholds. And, you know, judges are not economic experts and antitrust is often not their favorite uh, cup of tea. So they are saddled with a complex economic case. And until you have a presumption or precedence that sort of says, here's a dividing line that you can enforce and that's understandable both to you and to a common um, understanding, until you have that, it's really hard to enforce the law. So what the guidelines have proposed is to say when a hospital acquires, for example, when a hospital acquires an entity with more than 50% of a market share, let's say it acquires a cardiology practice and it has more than 50% of a market share, or let's say it acquires more than 50% of the primary care physicians, that has the effect that the antitrust law calls foreclosure. It really means to other hospitals, it's going to be pretty hard for you to have a cardiology practice if all the good cardiologists are employed by your rival. It's going to be pretty hard for you to get any referrals if they have all of the primary care physicians. So that's where the presumption could have some real bite is to say, look, rather than have just these vague, undefined standards, let's put in some presumptions. So that's in the vertical area. In the cross-market area, the very important guideline specifically addresses that in guideline number seven. Uh, nerds like me have to quote the exact one. It's um, mergers should not entrench or extend a dominant position. And the idea is, as they put it in the guideline, they say with the agencies will evaluate whether a merger involving an already dominant firm may substantially reduce the competitive structure of the industry. So, Again, this sort of points to a willingness to look closely, and they've made this, the FTC has said this in speeches and other guidelines. It has said, we're going to look closely at cross-market mergers. We're going to see whether there is the potential for anti-competitive effects. Now, this is why our law review article is 92 pages. There's a lot to do here. There's a lot of precedent to unpack, to apply, and so forth. But the idea is that you could come up with different ways of analyzing it and come up with a sound economic case that would be administrable, that a court could understand and could administer in this area. And I I can mention a few if you want me to go into further detail of of the ways in which the law could change to be more, apply closer scrutiny to these mergers. Professor, pivoting a little bit to a different area, I've been hearing 
a lot from my colleagues who engage in merger work and uh, getting deals through the various agency approvals. And what I've heard from them is, hey, well, why isn't the consumer welfare standard enough? And we already have the presumption of anti-competitive effects for horizontal mergers that increase concentration beyond a particular threshold. Why are these not enough? And wouldn't particularly in healthcare, wouldn't the consumer welfare standard be particularly important? So why are those tools that we've had to date not enough? Why do we need all these presumptions? First is what I've said already is the gaps that are there, which are just mergers that are just assumed to be okay, cross-market, vertical. Those just require more sophisticated attention. The professor at Georgetown, Steve Salop, has written endless articles of very sophisticated economic articles demonstrating that vertical mergers can, not always, but can have an anti-competitive effect. So ignoring them is is just not defensible in this modern age. The other point I'd point out about the super welfare standard is there's a sort of a black hole that antitrust doesn't really address too effectively or really try to generally ignores, which is quality which is what about the effect of consumers on consumers of enhanced or diminished quality? And that's something that has been uh, certainly hard to litigate in terms of what is an appropriate measure of quality? Is it just mortality? How do you measure that? That's one of the, the obstacles. But you know, a full and effective consumer welfare standard would pay more attention to that. And there, there has been some very good writing. A professor at Gonzaga has done some really interesting writing on that score. But you're right. I mean, certainly the idea here is that if you are going to address vertical and you're going to address cross market issues, you want to have a standard that makes sense in terms of consumer welfare. Now, some have criticized the guidelines for not focusing exclusively on price. One point that's sometimes mentioned is price is the lodestar here. That's all we should be concerned about. And that's it. But it's unfortunate that some forget that Antitrust is really a legal process. It really is a way of sorting out possibilities, probabilities, and so forth. So price is certainly something that sometimes you can measure, sometimes you can predict, but sometimes you have to go with other factors. And concentration is an appropriate one because, first of all, that's what the Clayton Act was all about. It really was about concentration. Those who believe in original intent have to go back and read the debates in the 50s when the Clayton Act was amended and back in 1917 when it was enacted. It was really about controlling power and bigness. Now, that's not enough. And we've moved on beyond that simple measure. But we do need to look at other things. And innovation is another area where consumer welfare is definitely affected. And again, bigness tends to block innovation because the incentives dry up, the incentives disappear when you control an entire market. So there are legitimate questions being raised about the guidelines, but I think on the whole, they're moving in the right direction. So another question that comes to mind is the sort of impact here on efficiencies. And in healthcare, clinical integration, improvements in quality, redundancies, just general improvement of patient care are arguments that are often made concerning both conduct and transactions. And be curious to hear from you, Professor, if there's anything in the draft merger guidelines that would sort of tackle those issues and how the enforcers are thinking about those problems or those efficiencies. To some extent, the guidelines really echo what the existing law is. And the existing case law is pretty demanding on efficiency justifications. Several courts have said, you know, efficiencies are easy to claim and hard to establish or prove in a sensible way. And the case law has been pretty consistent in saying that um, efficiencies must be verifiable, not speculative, merger-specific, meaning they have to be caused by the merger, not by some other effect that could be achieved otherwise. And they have to be pro-competitive. They have to be the kinds of things that really enhance competition. So you look at those criteria, and there's, in fact, One court has done the research and said, you know, there's never been a merger that has been excused exclusively by efficiencies. That's not to say efficiencies don't count in litigation. You guys are experts in litigation. And if you say something often enough, 
uh, you know, the judge is not going to ignore it. So I think it may waft over into other issues when a judge is trying to decide what he or she thinks about the merits of a case. But it really hasn't been one that has blocked merger enforcement by itself. But I think the guidelines do appropriately set, keep the bar high or endorse that area. One other thing let me throw in that's really important is that several of these other sort of areas we haven't discussed are really important. One is the so-called problem of serial acquisitions. When a, an entity buys or acquires a small firm here and there or a small group of physicians here and there, and none of those are even trigger the Hart Scott Rodino review process, they tend to get ignored. And then suddenly you wake up one morning and they control 60% of the cardiologists or a big chunk of the physicians are now their employees. So again, the, the guidelines importantly say, we're going to treat serial acquisitions as a group. We're going to say, what's happened over the last five years and how does that collectively affect competition? So again, it's a tricky business because the last one jumping on board may be the one that gets challenged, but they may try to unwind prior acquisitions too, which itself causes some problems. But at least the guidelines are pointing to these areas that at least the evidence of, again, these are much evidence-based guidelines. They're really based on sort of what the economics teaches. They're trying to bring enforcement in line with that evidence. But again, not to be too pessimistic, takes a while to move that tanker boat, as I suggested earlier, and uh, it may be a while. On the other side of the coin, I go back to the, uh, the beginning of time. Back, I was actually at the Justice Department back when Bill Baxter put out his merger guidelines, and they radically reshaped the way courts looked at mergers. And in fact, I haven't done an account, but I bet you that the merger guidelines are cited more frequently than Supreme Court cases generally. They're treated as if they're law. They're not law in any sense. They're just saying, here's what we think is important. But they're sort of a comprehensive, systematic look at the problem. And um, as I said, uh, courts, generalist judges need that. and They need something to hang their hats on. So uh, they can move the tanker ship eventually, but uh, it may take a while. So, Professor Greeny, that's a great segue for the, the last thing that we want to talk about. And that's about how you view future enforcement. And you've already sort of covered some things that I was going to ask, but I'll go back to one of them, which is when a merger is part of a series of multiple acquisitions. And I think this sort of speaks to the FTC's case with the anesthesiology practices in Texas, although that involves private equity and some other issues. You know, one of the things that has been going on for a while, it looks like in the healthcare space, has been these serial acquisitions or lots of small mergers and acquisitions of providers. And so how do you see, based on the guidelines, which as you have indicated, these guidelines are just that. They are draft guidelines, but ultimately courts and litigators clearly rely upon them. And so how do you foresee those kinds of acquisitions? Do you see them being challenged in the future? Yeah. So it's been a lot of years since I was an enforcer, but I provide unsolicited advice on this score. I think clearly what they're going to do is they're going to look for winnable cases in receptive courts. And those are two big challenges. So what is a winnable case? Well, if history is a guide, the clearest measure of a winnable case is one in which you have internal documents that our friends who have MBAs have kindly written that uh, give away the farm in terms of litigation. They say, well, we're going to raise price. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. So that certainly helps a lot. They also want to have a sound economic basis for it. And market definition has just baffled courts for many years. And now it's finally come under control. But for many years, they were using a, a measure of market definition, the so-called Elzinga Hogarty test that, you know, even Elzinga himself testified made no sense in healthcare. <laughs> you know, he said it, it just doesn't work here. It was meant for coal and it really is not a good measure. So more sophisticated methods are have been developed over time, and it takes a while. But I'd say certainly that's part of it. Having a winnable case is a big part. The other part, just to be you know the legal realist in the room, is that you have to come before a court that's receptive. And frankly, there are any number of circuits, and you guys as litigators know, that are just simply not receptive to antitrust 
and certainly new ideas in antitrust. So when they bring a case, and certainly in the cross-market area, I think it will be one that has all the bells and whistles I was describing, because the last thing they want to do is lose their first major challenge. Now, they have brought one or two cases which sort of reflect on that. There was one in the pharmaceutical area where the issue was cross-product markets. In other words, they would be able to leverage, strengthen one one pharmaceutical product to benefit the ones, the sort of must-have pharmaceuticals to get higher reimbursements in their other pharmaceuticals. So they're clearly looking at that. The commissioners themselves have said they were. So I think they'll be looking for that perfect case, but they sure want to win that first case when they bring it. I think we're running out of time, but um, I do have one last question. Just an answer to those colleagues and friends who do a lot of deal work and from whom I've heard uh, the earful about the draft merger guidelines. Do you think that the FTC, I mean, certainly the lower thresholds and some of these presumptions are going to bring the many more of these mergers and proposed acquisitions under scrutiny? Do you believe the agencies are equipped to handle the onslaught, the overflow of merger cases that they may have to litigate? Yeah, that's a great question because, uh, you know, again, as a former enforcer, staffing is everything. You have to be able to litigate a case. And that's why the states are almost impotent in terms of bringing cases. The states just can't handle a major case. They do it in conjunction with the FTC. But they just don't have the staffs. There are many states in which they have one, one lonely person doing antitrust. So staffing is a big issue and allocating your resources is a big issue. So that'll certainly be a constraint. And frankly, there is a blowback against everything about big government to take all of that in Washington. So in terms of funding of the FTC and the things like that, those are other, other constraints. And the other constraint is what I just talked about, which is do they want to find a winnable case. So I don't think they'd be going willy nilly challenging every merger here and there. I think their focus is going to be on winnable cases and creating precedent. So again, as an enforcer, I'd say, show me a case I can win. Show me one that will create a good lasting precedent and that we can start trotting around in other cases. So I think that'll be their focus rather than sort of picking on everything in sight. But who knows? There's there are countervailing pressures uh, all over the place. Well, hopefully the higher filing fees will aid at least in terms of funding some of this anticipated right. litigation. Right. So, you know, I wanted to say thank you very much, Professor Green, and thank you to Jean for participating today. Two notes for the listeners. First, I highly recommend reading the comments of the professors of law and economics, economists, and health policy researchers on the draft merger guidelines, which include Professor Greeny. Those were submitted on September 18th, 2023. And secondly, shout out to Professor Greedy, who is also an author. His book is St. Sebastian's School of Law. It's a novel that Professor Greeny has written. So not only is he an expert in antitrust, but he also is an expert in fiction. And so I highly recommend his book as well. It's a satire about law school teaching. And there are few topics as easy to satirize as law school teaching. So it was a pleasure. And by the way, having Jimmy succeeded so admirably. He carried me on his back for years as my research assistant. And watching him succeed, you know, there was no doubt it was going to happen, but it's, it was a real pleasure to watch him perform in the Sutter case and uh, advance through as now a seasoned litigator. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Professor. And that's all the time we have for today. And thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Take care. That's all for our show today. If you like the podcast, make sure to subscribe to Antitrust Matters and leave us comments on how we were doing or on the topics you would like us to cover going forward. You can also follow us on Twitter at CC Antitrust or follow the Constantine Cannon Antitrust team on LinkedIn. Until next time, be well and remember, Antitrust Matters. Antitrust Matters.